Hey there. So here's a little segment on salvage and components. Uh, yesterday I built a uh, hack vision circuit that uh, is running asteroids. So I was thinking it would be nice if I could uh, interface my Arduino into a television that only had an analog over-the-air tuner. Um, you know, channel 3, or channel 4, or something like that. So, those types of televisions are pretty common in Goodwill for five, ten dollars. I uh, bought a portable one today for five dollars. But uh, I also got this. It was uh, laying in a pile of trash. That uh, was what I would call it. With the uh, power adapters and uh, USB cables and various other junk they didn't know what else to do with. So this is an RF modulator for a Nintendo 64. I guess that's the standard connector that thing has. I don't know. Who cares? This is an F connector like you would find on a uh, US NTSC analog television. And uh, there's an antenna port and a uh, channel select. So we're going to uh, salvage this thing. I can't imagine very many people have a Nintendo 64 and would ever use this. And it looks like it had been sitting in Goodwill for a while, so I'm going to part it out and uh, just use the RF modulator circuitry as an output for the uh, Arduino. Now I will probably end up modifying this so it has a couple of pigtails going to a uh, RCA jack so it could plug into anything. But uh, I may not. Uh, I am sure this requires 5 volts. So it's not going to just be able to run by itself. This is interesting. <laughs> They've actually taken an off the shelf RF modulator unit like you would find in a VCR and they have left the antenna jack and the input jack off, or the output jack here. I've left them completely off the board. And uh, let's see, this is going to require a little bit of frying. There's a plastic clip that's melted into the board so it doesn't vibrate. <clears throat> so here we go. This is remarkably crude considering the Nintendo 64 is, you know, really not that old. I mean, this is something I would expect to see in the mid 80s. It's a really crude circuit. It'll work though. It's uh, an IF mixer circuit. I don't even see a crystal oscillator. Where on earth? I don't think it even has a crystal oscillator. So this thing works. Uh, yeah, it's got a tank circuit. That's amazing. That's terrible. Um, this circuit works by uh, taking the NTSC composite signal here off of this. Actually, it looks like it might even be a. Uh, S video. Uh, I see two video lines and one audio. Either that or it's stereo. Can't be stereo. Oh well. Surely it's not stereo. Anyway, uh, the video portion of this thing works by uh, taking that baseband composite signal and mixing it with a uh, RF oscillator. The baseband is uh, 
as many of you may have seen in the past, uh, a uh, 6 megahertz signal uh, centered around uh, 3.14 megahertz. So, you take that uh, 6 megahertz signal and then mix it with an RF oscillator that is just below or just above, depending on how it's designed, um, the channel that you want it on. So let's say your television channel is uh, was it 58 megahertz for channel 4, I think. Channel 3, either way, I don't remember. Anyway, mix it with that 6 megahertz signal and then you've got 58 to uh, 64 megahertz, for example. And uh, that's something a analog TV tuner can ingest. And then it converts it down into the various signals required to drive the CRT. So I don't need this antenna jack at all. I'm just going to remove it. I won't be using it with an antenna. Well, I'm going to keep the connector. Salvage the connectors. You may need that for something. You know, heck, you may need it for this. If you uh, put this in the box with the Arduino, you may want this F connector on the box as the output. But I'm going to leave it like this for now. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, maybe I'm not. This thing has been twisted back and forth so much the ground braid is gone. I mean, it's there, sort of. But it's not actually attached to the board anymore, so I'm going to have to take this completely apart and do some repairs on it. And while I'm doing that, I might as well put that connector in place. I think it will fit in this hole. Yeah, it should just fit in that hole. Over, uh, You know, maybe I'll leave it here. I might uh, put this case back on, which case I'll just put it back here. If the wires will reach. And it looks like they will, so that's what I shall do. Now, deciphering this mess, I, I don't know. It's got hot glue and all kinds of different colored wires that are bizarrely not soldered where they're supposed to be. <laughs> Which you can see why they didn't want to take this shield off. It has a, this is actually made for a game. The uh, stencil on this side says game. And it's a four pin connector with one of them marked as number one. So, I need to know what these are, obviously. Clearly brown is ground, and yellow traditionally is uh, video. And white is traditionally audio. And I'm going to guess that green must be power. That uh, would make some amount of sense. I don't have a Nintendo 64, obviously, so that's kind of a dead end trying to uh, reverse engineer it. But I do have a computer, and uh, now that I know it's for a Nintendo 64, look up uh, RF modulator pinout and uh, shock someone uh, on Makezine has already 
taken this very device and done exactly what I'm doing with it. So maybe they posted the pinout. Yep, gamesx.com wiki has the pinout right here. And this little plug here has RGB outputs, composite sync ground, S video, chroma, S video, lumina, uh, composite video, 5 volts, and left and right audio. So clearly, this is just using the left audio output to the TV. And uh, 75 ohm resistor to composite video and 220 microfarad capacitor in series is recommended for composite video input. Okay. Sounds reasonable. I, uh, I can do that. Now the question is, what colors are the wires? Have they bothered to label them? <clears throat> They've got a photo of the motherboard pinout. Which might be helpful. Or not. I'm going to say not. Unless this is uh, where one of my favorite devices might come in handy. Um, that little guy there. Which, you know, obviously use those with it. So, problem solved. Yeah, we know the color code. <clears throat> so, we have the pen out here as 11. So, this must be 11, and that's 12. 11 and then 9 is composite video so it's green that's video on this one 9 and then 8 it's chroma how interesting saying is that 10 9 10 that's 10 okay so 10 yellow is 5 volts boy I would have really messed that up huh? and then uh, yeah see they bridged these two these two pins are five and six, and they've actually uh, gone to the trouble of bridging them even, so they really want their ground to be good. I don't blame them. Weird stuff happens when you've got a bad ground. And uh, so I would want to make some note here. That yellow is power, and I'm going to guess that now that I know that it'll be obvious that it is, yes, it goes directly to an electrolytic. Shocking though it may be, it uh, feeds directly into a set of electrolytic capacitors, and uh, it's also the one marked out on the board. So we've got our green for composite video and white for audio. So I'm going to, uh, for right now, just tack some wires onto those uh, pins. And uh, let's see here. I don't want to use those. I have some clip wire over here. Whole big mess of hookup wire. 
might be tempted to use some coax even. I don't think I will. At least not right now. So I'm going to get a white wire and a black wire and a red wire and a yellow wire and make this color code a little more conventional. So I can remember it without having to remember it. So luckily these are already tinned. I'm just going to shove them through the correct side of this board. Well, there's hot glue in the way, and I don't need this giant cable. I'm going to keep the cable, right? Salvage the cable. Cables, especially four conductor cables, are expensive. Don't throw this away. This goes right back in that hookup wire box. Right over here on the shelf. While I'm thinking about it. It's important to do these things while they're fresh in your mind. Otherwise you end up with a four foot pile of stuff that you have to spend a, a whole day sorting through. You know, maybe I should make sure this wire will fit through these holes. Mm, it will. It's just being a pain. Probably need to trim it a little bit. I mean, that is kind of ridiculously long. Yeah, it just needed a little trim. Now, I still have a bunch of this uh, with hot glue on this thing from these. I guess they figured hot gluing the wires down will make them stick better. That's um, honestly a very bizarre line of thinking because, you know, hot glue is not, not a fabulous mechanical uh, connection for wires because, well, wires kind of need a little bit more help than that. It just means the wire is going to break right at the edge of the hot glue. Really. All right. <clears throat> this green wire is going to get replaced with yellow. Try not to lose track of your little bits of wire, honestly. It's not a bad thing to keep some of those. Especially the longer ones. If you end up with a longer piece of wire, don't throw it away. If you're uh, trimming resistors, keep that little bit of wire that you trim off the resistor lead. The uh, those make a uh, nice little uh, jumpers or whatnot on a board. So. Uh, if you need to jump over a trace on the top side of the board, for example, that's the perfect thing to do it with. So, <clears throat> so we've got uh, video and power right here. Now, there's one other thing that I would suggest doing. in this situation, and uh, that is, uh, once this video line is, uh, well, hook the ground up and I'll show you. The so ground is the far end. Just needs a little kink in here because of the shields in the way. Also, if you're not very familiar with soldering, notice how I'm 
I'm touching the pad and the wire, and I'm touching the solder to the opposite side of both from the iron. Because you don't want your... Sometimes you do need to tend the iron a little bit, though. You don't want the solder to touch the iron. You want the solder to touch the pad and have the pad melt the solder. If you touch the solder to the iron, you end up with a glob of solder laying on the board not connected to anything. Which uh, might seem like it would work until about three days later when you are tearing your hair out trying to figure out why it quit working. Alright, same thing. Touch the wire and the pad on the opposite and then touch the solder to the opposite side. Then pull the iron off the instant the solder melts, otherwise you uh, can damage the pad or the board or both. The soldering iron is considerably higher temperature than this board can handle, so if you leave the uh, iron on the board too long, the board will actually burn. These boards, uh, fiberglass boards like this, I think, burn around 450 Fahrenheit. The iron, you know, usually have higher than that. On this video line, I am going to uh, do this. All right. And then on the audio line, I'm going to do this with the power. This will uh, balance the impedance a little bit. If you have these wires floating around out in free space, then uh, the video particularly will be susceptible to your hand waving past it and things like that, and you, you don't want that, especially on a, um, using the Arduino TV out library. Because the Arduino is a microcontroller, so it's not always outputting the video. So you're going to have some televisions anyway are going to flip out because the video signal disappears when it thinks it should be there. And uh, changing the impedance you know, getting too close and far away, changing the impedance, and while the video signal's dropping in and out, is just going to add confusion to the mix. So avoid that. Uh, audio line eh, doesn't matter much. There's not much of a reason to do this because this is a a single phase, but. Uh, Either way, this is uh, unbalanced, which means that one of these wires is a uh, is a, a reference, right? So this wire is always ground. This wire is always five volts, so it's unbalanced here. Um, incidentally, it doesn't matter that this is ground so much. It just, you know, it's a stable signal. And uh, I wouldn't put the video signal on the, around the positive because you may uh, have issues in the circuit here doing that. This is a, a fairly wideband signal and, well, you're feeding it right into a mixer so you might end up with an oscillator. A bad kind of oscillator, not, not the kind you want, something that would run away. So, I'm going to uh, strip back just enough of this to fit in the breadboard. Same with these two. Oops. Wrong hole. This is 0.75 uh, millimeters. All right, so this thing's got to go at some point, but 
probably good enough for testing. So I'm going to bring over my breadboard here. <coughs> and this has got the uh, Hack Vision Arduino circuit from yesterday. And uh, this will make more sense too. See what I'm doing here. <clears throat> These two bus lines are ground and video. So I'm going to put the yellow wire into the video bus and the uh, ground wire into the ground bus. And five volts. I don't have a five volt bus, so. We're going to, uh, I mean, this is uh, D11, the blue wire is D11, that's audio out. So I'm going to bring that over there. I'm going to hook the 5 volts on the RF modulator directly to the 5 volts bus on the Arduino. And uh, there you go. We should have uh, an RF output here when we turn this circuit on. I need a uh, barrel connector to go on the end of my coax here. <coughs> I should have one over here somewhere. Uh, miscellaneous RF connector. Yeah. Not so much. But, um, uh, anyway. They go off into oblivion looking for something to connect these with. I may end up putting that F connector on there. <laughs> yeah. So much for that. Well, this is a better deal anyway. I, uh, I don't think this is going to work. There's no ground. I mean, look at this. I ain't gonna work right anyway. <clears throat> Again, I'm gonna keep this. Hi, this is an F connector jumper thingy. Um, yeah. Back in the uh, hookup wire box. That goes. And uh, that should be the video. And there's the RF output. So let's strip these back a little bit. There's a gizmo I recommend. These are cheap at Radio Shack. Sometimes you can find them like 30% off even when they have their tool sales. This is a, uh, what does Radio Shack call this? See. Helping Hands with Magnifier is what the Radio Shack uh, name for it is. And uh, I'd tell you the catalog number, but they don't seem to put those on anything even anymore. I don't... Oh, wait, maybe this is it. 640-0079. 640-0079. I got this one on sale fairly recently. Uh, they had a big tool sale. They were clearing out a whole bunch of screwdrivers. Some of the... Well, they're not nice screwdrivers. I didn't buy any. They're, uh, they may still have them on clearance. But uh, they were this type of screwdriver. They had uh, a set of Phillips and a set of flatheads and a set of nut drivers. Each one, each set was like four dollars. I think they're normally Ten. Those were on clearance, so that makes me think either they're doing away with those lousy screwdrivers, or uh, they're coming out with a little bit better uh, variety of them. On one hand, I kind of like those screwdrivers. On the other hand, I don't. So I. Uh, they have some uses. I prefer this, 
but uh, even the bits on these, some of these aren't small enough. You know, those other screwdrivers have uh, microscopic little blades on them that uh, come in handy. So it's kind of a bit of contempt. I don't, I don't like them, but sometimes they're handy to have. There's uh, not really very many other types of screwdrivers that are that small. And uh, that's the video here. RF output is this big pad up here. Right, and this uh, other big pad is where the shield on the coax went. Okay, so this is loose. I'm going to tighten this up so the ground is solid. Yeah, as solid as it gets. Always a bad idea to have a loose RF ground. Doesn't do you any good. In this case, I can't tighten it up any more than that, unfortunately. So, here we have a giant piece of coax. It's going to want to drag everything across the room connected to our uh, RF modulator. <coughs> now, all we should have to do is turn on the television. Television is conveniently already on channel 3. And when I turn this on, it will either work or smoke or uh, be on the wrong channel. All right, well, that doesn't work so well. Well, that's a really sloppy connection. So, I do have a bit of a signal on channel 3. I don't know why it's not better unless there is a problem here, but I don't think so. It uh, could be a matter of current. Maybe I don't have enough. Uh, let's see. The U connection's good. It's entirely possible this module's no good. Wouldn't that be a shame? Sometimes sometimes it turns out they're just no good. <clears throat> it could be that uh, just out of alignment as well. Hmm. Not at all. Well then, one option we have here is to see what on earth is going on and uh, find out why there is no signal. Or why it looks so bad. So I'm going to clip on to the F connector here and ground at the RF connector. 
and then uh, see what we've got here. So, let's see, I put, so my triggering to the video. Well, the output is, as the television suggests, nothing but noise. So, you can maybe see here, television output. Is a big mess of white. So, question becomes, why is that? And uh, if you recall, there was a comment about using a uh, 75 ohm resistor and a uh, 220 microfarad capacitor on the output of this thing. So let's see what the scope has to say about uh, this here. Hmm. Indeed, the problem seems to be that uh, the RF modulator is loading the output of the Arduino. So, I think we're going to need that capacitor. I'm going to double check what they suggested here. Uh, I guess that's almost certainly the problem. Nintendo 64 composite video. All right. 75 ohm resistor to ground and composite video and 220 microfarad capacitor in series with a note. Ah, 220 microfarad are polarized. Well, yes, they are. Thank you, Mr. Obvious. All right. So, it says in series of the output. It just so happens that 220 microfarads a common value, which I keep a hundred of on stock. I would suggest you do the same. All right. So it says in series, All right? All right. 220 microfarad in series on composite video. So I'm going to move this little guy over here to let's split these apart a little bit more. Move this over here.
and uh, positive lead always goes towards the thing generating the signal. If there's any question in your mind, the thing that generates the voltage is the thing you want to have the positive pointed towards. All right. So, signal is still a wreck. So that's where the 75 ohm resistor might come in handy. I don't have a 75. I have a hundred though, and uh, a hundred is close enough. So the hundred goes to ground. Yeah. I just need to move this video over. And 100 ohms to ground. I should get the impedance in the ballpark. Alright. So, signal still looks like a train wreck. Another issue you're going to have is that. Uh, Analog televisions like to just, after sitting there for a minute not locking onto a signal, they like just drifting up and down the band, begging for a signal, so you might have to change channels. And come back a couple times. If you ever wondered why analog television went away, um, this is one of those reasons. So, analog television was great when it was invented, but uh, oh, it's just awful. From a circuitry standpoint, it's just a pain. I mean, there's some clever things you can do with it, especially with the micro. But uh, you can do much more clever things when you can tell the signal exactly where it's going. All right. That's still no good. And I'm going to guess that this module is just bad. And there's all kinds of things in this module. This module is just a, a mess. There's not even a crystal oscillator in it. It, uh, it has some garbage audio transistor for the RF output. Just ridiculous. But, as luck would have it, I have another RF modulator that uh, should be better that I picked up. So, never admit defeat until you're completely defeated. Um, so, tell you what I'm going to do here. I'm going to keep my hookup wire. And uh, there is nothing of value on that board, so it's going in the recycling pile. Now the box, look at the box. I'll keep the box. Uh, this other RF modulator might fit. You may want to kind of make it a generic little... Uh, RF modulator box. Uh, the other RF modulator is uh, a little bigger. Well, the device is a little bigger. Anyway. So we're going to have to uh, clear some space. But it's worth it, I swear. Yeah, that's that's the RF modulator there, which is handy because it's got these uh, convenient 
This is all this is a pile of parts. I mean, seriously, I'll throw these away. You know, there's uh, there's all kinds of stuff here that can be reused, and uh, I'll try to show you some tricks while we're taking this apart. If it's possible, yeah. This one's just so much trash; it doesn't even matter. So, I'm going to uh, yeah. what kind of plastic is this? Doesn't have a recycling symbol on it. Ah, but it does. It says it's uh, polystyrene. Okay. This is made in 1998. I don't know if you can see code here. Um, suggests this was made. A little fuzzy actually. Zero six. Hmm. Well, it was made in 1998. Anyway, the rest is a little unclear. So, um, if you look right here. Maybe you can see these little arrows. Those are telling you that those are the screws to remove in order to take something apart. Um, traditionally, electronics in the 80s and 90s would have uh, those arrows on everything. So, you can see here. Um, with a jog shuttle control. That might be fun. You can see here that, uh, indeed, those two arrows have pointed out the only two screws holding the faceplate on. Getting it off is a, a whole other trick. So, there you go. So, Shog shawl control. It's a nice one too. We uh, will be salvaging that at some point. This is a vacuum fluorescent display. Um, infrared receiver. Some uh, buttons with a rather bizarre uh, mechanical arrangement. A potentiometer, limit switch. There's a variety of good stuff on here. This is not part of it though. This goes, uh, I think. Yep, nothing there that's worth keeping. Start loading this into the uh, salvage. Ooh, here's another one a ground lug. And a uh, power cord. Now it's going to require a super small screwdriver. Um, don't throw this away either. Build up yourself a uh, little pile of sheet metal scraps and be careful they're sharp. But uh, that's useful for stuff. <clears throat> I mean, think of it this way if you buy yourself a $30 brake and shear, you can make this into a box. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at the price of sheet metal, 
ever, you will realize that that's well worth. <laughs> I see a, a child had access to this at some point. You want to see a dirty little secret of 80s and 90s electronics? <laughs> Look, there's no parts. Um, I mean, let me get the mechanical assembly out of here, but I'll show you. There's, there's like literally no parts on the board. And getting back to these arrows, this screw has an arrow pointing to it. This is a loader mechanism. Not that you'll ever need to know that in the future, but this is a loader mechanism. It won't come out, so that suggests I am missing a screw somewhere. So, no. That's the pry gently method. So the loader mechanism had screws with arrows pointing to them. Uh, right here and here. <coughs> this is the thing that would always break. You know, you'd go to stick your tape in and it would just flop and it wouldn't load. Well, these are designed that way, sort of. <coughs> when these VCRs cost $200, this was a $100 part because it's the part that always failed. Um, as far as things to salvage on this, this metal bar here, that uh, is worth salvaging. And uh, there's some races here. I wouldn't keep maybe all of this, but uh, this metal bar is terribly useful if you're building uh, things that use steppers that need the guides. And that's what that is, that's a guide. With a few metal pieces in here, and it's a really good, high quality piece of metal, too, as opposed to you know, well, every other piece of metal in here. <clears throat> it's part of the reason these cost so much. The other part is people broke them all the time, but uh, anyway, you may or may not want to keep some of these plastic things. There's races and channels and gears and springs. I'd keep the springs if nothing else. Springs are small. You know how many times you need a spring like that that'll do something like that. Maybe you don't ever need them, but I do. <coughs> so here's our RF modulator. See, this one <laughs> is not junk. That's actually a receiver, too. So that this may be more complicated than we're able to deal with even or at least more than I'm willing to deal with for this circuit. Now I strictly need a modulator. But I'd like to have one. This goes in the uh, in a box for power cables. If you ever need a power cable? And uh, that's uh, a good place to get them. DC motor I will keep. This uh, part of the loader it uh, twiddles all the stuff around and pulls the tape up against the uh, head here. Among other things this motor drives this mechanism here which I probably just broke but who cares. Um, yeah, I did. Oh, I remember fixing VCRs. I'd fix five or six VCRs a day, and oh, you wouldn't believe how many times it was this thing that had snapped just like I just did. It wasn't necessarily broke, it just jumped a tooth. And oh my goodness, when these jump a tooth, it's just. It's not hard to get them back, but it takes years to, you know, um, build up the skill to figure out. How to put them back the way they belong. So, I uh, I don't miss these devices at all. 
I sort of relish in the destruction of them, personally. Every dead VCR makes me happy inside. Uh, just, I don't know what. It's a really lousy VCR. In the late 90s when these things started getting pumped out of China, the quality just went to garbage. Um, they used to be made out of metal. They had uh, belts on them. You know, belts don't break, so they'll slip. Which is, uh, for the consumer, a good thing. For the manufacturer, that's terrible because it can be fixed with a new belt that costs 50 cents. Or a rubber band for the desperate. I have no idea. There must be screws on the bottom. Yeah. Figures. Yeah, it's even worse than that. There are uh, screws not accessible through the chest. And which is a situation that I've seen many, many times. So, I can tell you right now that this modulator is not going to be terribly useful to me. Um, now, don't get me wrong, it's a nice modulator. I don't think it's going to be terribly useful. So, but we'll see. I may get surprised. All right, a Jolly Rancher. That's how I can tell there was a kid in here. Kids like uh, feeding Jolly Ranchers to the happy VCR man. At least until it stops playing its tapes. Oh, this is a ridiculous device here. Brilliant piece of engineering, but uh, wow. Just uh, expensive to replace and endless grief. Uh, but I want this. Uh, hey, this one actually has a belt on it. Wow. So I'll keep the belt too. But I want this. Uh, motor somehow. I'm sure there's a button that when pressed the motor and all everything surrounding it explodes into a pile of parts but I don't really know where that button is. Oh there it is. There's the magic button. Yep. The average person probably wouldn't know that and I uh, that there's a magic button that releases all the parts but Believe me, you're not missing anything. That knowledge is years of my life. I wish I had back. So, there's a motor. It even has a nice little connector on it. I like the header. That's sweet. Uh, the rest of this, however, is a big... Well, I'm not going to just say it's trash. I will tell you that this head right here might be of use to you. This is a tape eraser head. Um, it also does another thing. This one's got several pins on it, so it suggests to me that it's not just a tape eraser. It's also a, um, well, it would, have, it would have to be the sink detection, I would think. The way that this whole magic device is, works, just if, in case you care, um, you might say, well, how do they keep this in the sink, right? Because... If you remember, the tapes had multiple speeds on them. Some even had a dial to select the speed when you're recording. Uh, it didn't matter what speed you recorded at. Uh, because this head would always pick up the sync pulse. Um, the sync pulse had a, was written to a little stripe at the bottom. About a millimeter wide. And this little gizmo would pick up the sync pulse. And... Uh, adjust the rotational speed of this head here to match the, the sync pulse exactly. 
So you could even change speeds mid, you know, from one frame to the next. And believe me, a lot of movies did that. You would, um, that's something a lot of people don't know, I suppose, that the lead ins and like the um, FBI warnings and silly stuff like that, uh, those things would be super slow speed because they're basically a still image. So they might, uh, you know, normally you'd have, in a VCR, you'd have uh, 30 half frames per second. And, uh, you know, you could slow that down to next to nothing. You know, 20, 24, 20. You could really drop the speed down. You could uh, do that and you could um, adjust the tape feed speed. And, uh, you know, you could sit there for an hour showing the FBI warning or whatever they put on there and not use two minutes worth of tape. So, normally I'd suggest keeping these screws, but these are junk. Pot metal screws. If you have a metal recycler, you might consider uh, sending them that way. These gears, and this little gear assembly, I'm keeping. Because, incidentally, it fits this motor. And, uh, that might be useful. All right, so just a man on his board, the shuttle jog, hmm, 1990s Jolly Rancher, like, that can go. And uh, the shuttle jog control has a big arrow here saying dip, telling you that there's a dip connector. It's not a dip in the road, unfortunately. Uh, oh, this whole mess comes out of here somehow. Again, more magic clips. Ugh. These things are just awful. Alright. A giant piece of trash. Well, she know how to melt this down. I suppose if you had a uh, injection molding system you could chip that up and reuse it. Tempting, actually. Very tempting. Um, same with those. Um, this is something you might keep because it matches uh, this thing here, which I would suggest salvaging. But uh, back to my point. Notice how this has like a million holes for parts and uh, no parts. Yeah, dirty little secret. Eh, maybe not dirty. It's really pretty smart. They would make one board for every model that they could possibly sell and then they would just put the parts in for the board or for the device they're making at the time. This even has stencils for the belts and the gears and I mean it's really pretty intricate. They've put a lot of thought into uh, the design of this board just to make the manufacturing as cheap as possible. <clears throat> they even have a plastic transistor over here. I mean, really? A plastic transistor. All right, now there's all kinds of stuff here that I, I wouldn't want you to overlook. Um, it may not seem valuable to the untrained eye, but this right here, this black stalk sticking out of here, that's a that's an interrupter, optical interrupter. Don't throw those away. You know, if you have the means, and I would suggest you buy the means, a solder pot. Um, actually, this has to be soldered, removed by hand, because there's a plastic supports, and you wouldn't want to melt them on this. This whole thing would melt into a pile, but these interrupters... Are really useful. Basically you have an infrared transmitter on one side and an infrared receiver on the other 
it's a little less complicated than that. That's effectively what they are. It's marked on the board as a diode. It's uh, actually two diodes. The, both the transmitter and the receiver are a diode. Um, Kirchhoff's law, if uh, you're familiar with physics. Um, anything that emits radiation will also um, accept radiation of the same frequency. So if you have a red LED, or, or let's say two red LEDs that are the, exactly the same wavelength, you can use one as a transmitter and one as a receiver. So Kirchhoff's law, go look it up. So that's what they do here. They put two identical diodes across from each other, and then um, there's little plastic bits. And when they interrupt the signal, or interrupt the one transmitting, you lose your voltage. Let's see, the, the photons coming from one hit the uh, uh, diode junction of the other LED, and that produces a voltage out of the pin. So to light up the LED, you put voltage on the positive and negative pins. Well, if you put light photons into the junction of the LED, you will get electrons out of the pins as well. So you put, you know, a volt worth of maybe uh, 50 milliwatts into one LED, and you're going to get like 25 milliwatts out of the other LED. It's useful to know. I I don't know that I've ever found anyone that knew that, which is bizarre to me. But uh, nonetheless, this board is filled with interrupters. I mean, that's all VCRs are, are photo interrupters. There's one here and here, and they just look like little black specks. Here's two. They're everywhere on this board, and those are so useful. So salvage does. Be very gentle with them. The plastic stalks they're mounted on are fragile. Um, they'll be labeled diodes, so look for black plastic forks that look like that are labeled as diodes. Uh, that's a uh, socket. There's some IF stuff here, and here's a nice crystal. 3.57594 nine, four, or five. They actually have the crystal labeled wrong. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I know what the frequency is, though. Five, seven, five, nine, four, five. I hope to never have to know that in the future. It's a NTSC uh, color burst frequency. So, uh, there's some other things here. This is the uh, channel three, four switch which is why I think that this is just a complete waste of time to salvage this module uh, for my purposes. I want an RF output and a video and audio input, and this thing is just a whole universe. This has probably an I2C bus on it or something, and ugh, 20 connections. So I'm not going to bother salvaging it, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through this board and tell you what to salvage a little bit if you uh, run across a similar one. Um, these things up here are uh, start sensors. That's what they're called. Um, these are transistors, actually, with a um, darn it. <clears throat> this one's busted a little bit, but anyway, if I could get that out, I'll show you. This I don't want you to mistake this for a diode. This is actually a transistor. You notice how it has only two pins? Oh, let's see here. This right here is a transistor. It has two pins. So you're probably saying, well, why doesn't it have three? Well, look at this. You probably can't see that so well, but there's a lens on the transistor. Well, why would a transistor need a lens? Well, one of these is collector and one is emitter, but the gate. Remember what I was saying about um, diodes over here? That when photons hit the diode junction, they generate a voltage? Well, this transistor, the uh, transistor's two diode junctions together. So they have a lens focusing light onto the gate, right? So when photons hit the gate of the transistor, they 
create electrons, or free up electrons anyway, in the uh, doping material. So this is functioning as a switch. When the light is interrupted, ah, see this guy right here? This is a an infrared LED, a super bright infrared LED. And back there on the uh, loading mechanism and the uh, other gizmos, there were uh, little fiber optic channels that were channeling light through. And these uh, phototransistors were picking up the light from this LED as it passes through. And uh, the start sensor, if you look at a, a VHS tape, there's a lead-in, and the lead-in is clear, and the tape is black. So the very instant that the black part passes in front of this, again, it acts as a photo interrupter. So the light from this LED is blocked. And this over here isn't labeled, I don't think, but uh, this one is the opposite. So you've got a, a start sensor on the lead-in edge, the leading edge, and you've got over here a, uh, yeah, this one's labeled end sensor. So this one it detects the lagging edge of the tape. So you have a lead end that's clear and you have a lagging end that's clear. And uh, this one is the most critical part of VCR. Absolutely the most critical safety feature of the VCR. Because if this little guy malfunctions, uh, when you're uh, when you reach the end of the tape, the only way for it to know that it's the end of the tape is the sensor. So if this sensor fails, and believe me, it happened a lot, um, or this LED, or actually they used to use light bulbs. Oh, you could look inside and see a light bulb back in the six, uh, 70s and 80s on the VTRs and early VCRs. So one of these two devices would fail, and it would just it would just wind the tape up and just shred the tape because it couldn't tell it was the end of the tape. Uh, very common problem in mid '80s, up into the mid '80s or so. But uh, there's lots of transistors and junk I wouldn't keep. But keep the photo interrupters, keep the uh, photo transistors. You can use those for all kinds of neat stuff. Uh, fuse fuse holder, keep that. This transformer, um, that's probably useful because it's, uh, yeah, in fact, this power circuit's labeled really well, um, making it really easy to salvage parts out of it. Uh, these capacitors, this one's bad. Um, yeah, again, you probably can't tell, but the vent has uh, popped on it, so... I would suspect this VCR didn't even work. That's a fairly critical component, and it's popped, shorted out, opened up, and probably wasn't uh, producing a proper picture. But these all look all right. You know, up to you if you want to salvage them, but I don't salvage electrolytics much. Used ones tend to be bad. Uh, MOV, I think. It's marked a capacitor, but it's actually an MOV. That's for a line suppression. 120 volts comes in here, and you've got a line suppressor uh, to uh, deal with uh, transients, 1,000 volts, you know, power length, and whatever. So uh, these little uh, tactile switches, I would I would pull those off if possible. Vacuum fluorescent display. Whew. It's tempting to want to pull that, but it's a VCR uh, vacuum fluorescent display. And the display driver on this one's surface mount. That uh, right there is the display driver. Plus, the bad thing about VFDs is that um, somewhere in here is a 270 volts. Because um, these are vacuum tubes, so you're going to have to have a uh, plate voltage of you know 300 volts or so in order to get this thing to glow. So you know, 300 volts isn't really a big deal, but it sounds like a big deal and it scares some people. So 
I would avoid even bothering with those unless it's for you. Um, it's not a lot on the bottom of this. Um, again, save this. This is 10, I think. Pretty sure it's 10. But uh, these are really good for shields, as obviously it's what it's used for. So keep the shield. And uh, trash the board. I'm going to keep that. I mean, it's good. I just don't, it won't work for my immediate needs. So, that's about all. A little disappointed that I didn't get an RF modulator on the Arduino, but, uh, you yeah, know, that's fine. I, uh, I don't need it. I just thought it would be nice. I had other sources for them. I do like this, though, this shuttle jog control. That would be really neat for an Arduino circuit of some sort. And it has uh, buttons labeled play and uh, stop. You know, this whole whole assembly can be used just as it is. So, doesn't even need to be taken apart. It's got a plug on the bottom, and here's the other end of the plug. And uh, it's a dip plug so it'll solder right into a breadboard or something. But uh, that's about all. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed.